let's get started in building a carbon footprint report. It is essential in any carbon footprint report that you identify your intended audience. Identifying the audience will determine the format and content of the report. Carbon footprint reports can be for internal use, such as for a board of directors, your employees, or your management team. A carbon footprint report may be for external use, such as to meet a supplier requirement, an online CSR report, or a media press release. Finally, you may be building a carbon footprint report to be consistent with one or more international standards, such as the ISO 16064 standard or the Canadian Standards Association Clean Start Registry standard. Next, for any carbon footprint report, you must set boundaries. Boundaries determine what activities will be included as part of the report and which ones will be left out. Boundaries can include which facilities will be included in the carbon footprint report, which operations occurring in those facilities will be included, what level of ownership will be considered. For instance, will you only be considering facilities owned by the company, or will you be considering facilities that are leased as well? The level of granularity is also important. Will this carbon footprint only be measuring emissions produced by facility operations, or will it drill down to a product or a process level? The reporting period is very important. Normally, this is a period of one year. It may be a calendar year, or it may be a fiscal year. Each report should have a baseline. This is the year on which all future reports will be based. It should ideally be the first year for which you have complete information. And finally, which sources of emissions will be considered. You may only be considering Scope 1 or Scope 2 emissions. You may also be considering Scope 1, Scope 2, and certain Scope 3 emissions, but not others. Once your boundaries have been established, you'll need to collect the information. Likely sources of information will be monthly heating, electricity, and other utility bills. You should also have basic information for every facility that will be included in the carbon footprint report, such as the address, the square footage, and the number of employees. You may also obtain a list of vendors and clients for each facility. Services and amenities available at each facility should also be obtained, such as local recycling, whether or not there is an incinerator on site, and whether or not there are company vehicles attached to the facility. This will assist you in determining which sources you'll need to measure. Finally, depending on the level of granularity for the report, you'll need to determine facility outputs. These can be products, processes, or services provided or completed at the facility. When the time comes to put your data to paper, the cardinal rule of carbon footprinting is document, document, document. And when in doubt, document. Examples of things that should be documented in any carbon footprint report are a statement of boundaries, what facilities, processes, products and services, and source activities have been included, basic information for each facility, the procedure used to measure and calculate emissions from each source activity. For instance, for heating, were you using gas bills or were you using meter readings? For vehicles, did you use fuel receipts or were actual odometers read for each vehicle? Finally, any exceptions or exclusions to the carbon footprint report should be documented. If a facility or portion of facility, for instance a floor, was omitted, that reason should be documented in your report. If you are preparing your carbon footprint report to be validated by a third party using one or more international standards, such as ISO 14064, or the CSA, you should always go with the format provided by that organization. Most will have templates available online. 
if your report will not be third-party verified, the format you follow is pretty much up to you. However, there is certain information that should always be included in any good carbon footprint report. Totals from previous carbon footprint reports, especially from the baseline year. Background information on the subject of the footprint. This can be the organization or individual facilities. Or background information on a product if a product footprint is being done. An explanation of how activity data and emission factors were obtained. A list of all calculation formulas used. A statement of the boundaries for the report. And finally, an explanation of any exclusions and exceptions. Always remember to show how you obtain the final number. And once again, document, document, document. While not strictly necessary as part of a carbon footprint report, you may wish to make commitments to reduce your carbon footprint. These can be short-term or long-term commitments. Short-term commitments are usually accomplished between one and two years and require a low capital investment. Some examples are listed here below. Long-term commitments, usually run between two to five years, require a higher capital investment and often include some intermediate short-term goals. Some examples of these are listed below as well. Whether you are making short-term or long-term commitments, it's always important to make a business case for all your reductions. Hopefully, the content of this presentation has helped you to better understand the basics of carbon footprinting. For more information, please visit us on our website at www.e3solutionsinc.com. You can also follow us on Twitter or join our LinkedIn discussion group. Thank you, and have a great day.